Hi, Max. Hey, Bob. How's it going? I can't complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Right Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're Max Blumenthal, journalist, co-host of the podcast, Moderate Rebels. You write for various places, including The Gray Zone. And uh, you're a dangerous radical. Um, we're going to elaborate on that as we talk about your book, a book so dangerous that uh, actually there has been a concerted effort to keep you from discussing it in public in certain places, as we will discuss. That's how dangerous the book is, which in turn is a reflection on how dangerous you are. The book is called The Management of Savagery, How America's National Security State Fueled the Rise of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Donald Trump, just held up on the screen by Max himself, the author, for those of you who are just listening to the podcast, very attractive jacket published by Verso. Um, and uh, let's keep them in suspense about the attempt to deplatform you. Attempt or de attempts. I'm not sure if there's been more than one. Um, and let's talk about the book and then get into uh, the part of the book that seems to have most offended some people. Um, you know, the, the, the subtitle is uh, pretty straightforward, How America's National Security State Fueled the Rise of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Donald Trump. Um, I guess it sounds like there, there are basically two parts of the thesis, right? A, how we reacted to 9-11, we being the foreign policy establishment, U.S. government, how we reacted helped get Donald Trump elected, A, and B, the behavior of the national security establishment in the decades leading up to 9-11 uh, made 9-11 more likely to happen. So in that sense, the, the seeds of Don, the Donald Trump presidency go back to uh, at least 1979 when kind of the narrative starts. Is that a fair summary so far? Yeah, it's a really good summary. And, you know, it makes sense to me, <laughs> but, but uh, I mean, broadly speaking, I've, I've been kind of insisting that more than people realize American foreign policy is responsible for Donald Trump being president. I mean, a lot, there are a lot of things that had you changed them, had they been different, he would not have won the election. I just think this may be one of them. And, and, but, the, but the part I'm, I'm less conversant in and maybe more surprising to some people. I, well, I think a lot of the whole thing will surprise some people, but the part about possible U.S., um, I don't know if complicity is the right word, but, but, but in 9-11, but the way, because it's not like a conspiracy theory. It's just, right. it's just an argument that misconceived policies got us into the, the mess that led to 9-11. So do you want to yeah. start at the, at the beginning in, I think, 1979? Well, just to pick up on um, your point about 9-11, I mean, the way that I frame it as sort of an, 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 an inevitability of the way that empire had been constructed um, since the latter stage of the Cold War. Um, this was blowback for America's involvement in Central Asia and the Middle East, and specifically blowback for the what was at that point the largest covert operation that the CIA had ever waged. Uh, Operation Cyclone <clears throat> in Afghanistan, which began with Big New Brzezinski um, in 1979, it was, authorized. It was Carter's the, National Security it was Advisor. The National Advise, Security Advisor to Jimmy Carter, authorizing this kind of multi billion dollar campaign to arm and equip the Afghan Mujahideen, um, which allowed for the Saudi royal family um, in this kind of Faustian bargain with its clergy and the radical elements in its midst. Uh, to create a matching fund and bring figures like young Osama bin Laden uh, to the border of Afghanistan, to Peshawar, to set up or help set up the Services Bureau alongside Ayman al-Zawahiri of the Al-Jihad Organization of Egypt, um, uh, Omar Abdel Rahman, the blind sheikh uh, from Egypt, uh, arrived to Afghanistan on a CIA flight. And the CIA proceeded to put over $600 million of arms and equipment and training in the hands of uh, 
extreme Islamist warlords like Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, um, and you know the figures who received this training and weapons returned home or went to other battlefields, often in support of U.S. efforts to uh, destabilize the Soviet Union um, along its frontiers, and um, and then and later Russia and Chechnya and Bosnia, um, and so basically the U.S. created this problem for itself. Um, the U.S. national security state, really without any input from the public, um, you know, basically the CIA, the whole budget for this operation was voted uh, in a sort of semi-secret vote in the House Appropriations Committee through a black budget. So it's really, when we, when we use the term we, we're really not, we shouldn't be including ourselves because we, the U.S. public, never had any input on this. You had a national security state that really was never concerned about national security, uh, approving this entire operation and con concocting it uh, mostly in secret. Um, and, you know, this was clear when Spignu Brzezinski in 2006 was asked by a filmmaker, um, Samira Gochel, uh, do you have any regrets about the rise of Al Qaeda, um, creating the Taliban in Afghanistan? Um, and Brzezinski said, no, of course not. Um, you know, compared to bringing down the Soviet Union, the Taliban was insignificant. And so this really says it all. This sums up the mentality and the sensibility of the so-called national security state, which is that national security actually is secondary to uh, the cynical geopolitical ambitions yeah. of the U.S. elite. And so bringing down the Soviet Union was paramount in this case. And who cares if they got a disposal problem in which the blind sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman was actually given a special CIA visa to enter New York and help continue the Services Bureau, which became the basis for Al Qaeda inside New York. Um, you know, who cares that Ali Abdel Sud Mohammed, who had been, while he was working at Fort Bragg as an army colonel, was actually an agent of the Al Jihad organization working under orders from bin Laden's eminence, Greece, Ayman al Zawahiri, and was simultaneously working with the CIA and FBI. Mm. Who cares about that? Well, that Who was cares? very much that was very you much know. kind of the mindset. I mean, you know, Brzezinski was, of course, a hardcore Cold Warrior. You know, in a lot of ways, he is, I would say, relative to or was relative to a lot of foreign policy thinkers are now influential. And, and, and in a lot of ways, he was a relatively common sense, you know, he, 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 was, he was wiser in some respects than many, but he had an out-and-out -out obsession with the Soviet Union. And, and he wasn't all that out of step with the, frame, the kind of public frame of mind. I mean, you were like born in 1979. I was 77. like... 77. Uh, in, in, in what? In, in 77. 77. Okay, yeah, so you were born around then. I was like in college... The um and you know it, it was it wasn't the best kept secret in the world. First of all, the Afghanistan intervention, and it's not like there was anybody who was going to particularly mobilize against it in an influential way. Anyway, I mean, and it's kind of ironic that Carter is, I think, associated with the phrase he had warned at some point. I don't know as a candidate or president what against having an inordinate fear of communism. I think that's the actual quote, and yet. If you ask, like, what is the unifying thread or one unifying thread between, like, how we wound up involved in Afghanistan in the first place, which you're saying kind of led to 9-11 or was part of the chain, and how we, and the missteps after 9-11, in both cases, it involves just exaggerating a threat, getting too freaked out, right? I mean, we were, we were too freaked out about the Soviet Union and... Um, and that led to Afghanistan. And then, in your telling, Afghanistan helped uh, lead to the rest. So, I, I don't know. You, you may have a different reading on, on the kind of motivation. Uh, 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 and, and, and maybe you see it as more, more of a conscious, like, imperial quest than I do. But it seems to me part of the problem is everyone freaking out about too much over threats. Well, I spell it out in my book, The Management of Savagery, um, and how I saw um, what are often perceived as missteps being kind of calculations. 
Um, but starting with Brzezinski, I think, you know, he's a good model for how these calculations develop uh, his own personal history. His family were landowners in Galicia, um, which is now Lithuania and Western Ukraine, which is really the base of this revived Ukrainian nationalism. Um, he hated the Soviet Union for what they did with his family and its land um, and Galicia as a whole. Um, this, you know, this was an area where you had the, um, I think the, you know, the Ukrainian partisan army collaborating with Nazi Germany uh, towards the second half of World War II um, during its occupation. I'm, I could be wrong about that. Uh, Brzezinski, you know, he goes on to, you know, I, um, I think he was a mentor to Madeleine Albright, who adopted a similar mentality to his, um, but she implemented it after the Cold War. But what Brzezinski wanted to do was settle the score with the Soviet Union. There was really very little foresight about what working with extreme Islamist elements in Central Asia and Middle East could do. Um, and so, you know, after the Cold War, after the Soviet Union um, is broken up and the U.S. <clears throat> sort of claims victory and embraces this triumphalist attitude um, as a unipolar power, um, you start to see these documents tumbling out of think tanks, specifically neoconservative think tanks in Washington. Um, and you've written about them, Bob, the Project for a New American Century, also the Clean Break document, um, which was authored by Richard Pearl and Doug Fife and uh, David Wormser, who's now in John Bolton's uh, Shadow NSC, um, for Benjamin Netanyahu. And these documents, along with the... Um, Wolfowitz, um, a series of national security documents Wolfowitz produced under George H.W. Bush really spell out what the U.S. aims to do after the Cold War, which is to take advantage of the fact that the Soviet Union's no longer there to back up states that defy the U.S. sphere of influence and to bring them down to carry out regime change in at least seven countries in five years. Um, and I so think they, it's they in, mean what, Iraq, Syria, Iran, what? Iraq, what? I mean, they were even talking about, you know, Sudan and Libya also, you know, all the countries that have been. And, made, and here you talk about a, a clean break more than the PNAC letter. Is that right? The, well, the clean break document provides details on how this will be carried out all the way down to um, working with Sunni Arab tribes in northeastern Syria, hmm. um, you know, around cities like Raqqa, which ultimately became the base for ISIS's caliphate. So these details are really chilling. Um, but you have this all spelled out. And the question is, how do we get to this? This was a question the neocons were entertaining. And I think it's in Bob Kagan and William Crystal's um, essay for uh, foreign affairs, uh, but, you know, towards a benevolent hegemony. You know, how do we get you mm -hmm. know, the U.S. to be this global benevolent dictator um, where they say short of a catastrophic and catalyzing event, this regime change project will be difficult to realize. So you have 9-11, the catastrophic and catalyzing event that opens up the floodgates for this entire program at a time when George uh, W. Bush had handed over um, you know, a lot of offices in the civilian wing of the Pentagon to the neocons themselves. So I write about Wesley Clark um, you know, striding into the Pentagon a few days after 9-11. He was then, I think, the Supreme Commander of U.S. Forces in Europe. And a member of the Joint Chiefs um, is complaining to him that Rumsfeld had just handed him a memo calling for regime change in seven countries in five years. So I don't think that, you know, these were necessarily missteps, although, the, you know, the re U.S. regime change policy. I mean, the whole point of me writing this book is to show how U.S. regime change policy has driven our dystopian politics, along with destabilizing entire regions of the globe. but. They've benefited. It's benefited a a national security elite mm -hmm. in many ways, and that's why I think you know we've come full circle. Not to jump ahead too much, but that's why we've come full circle to the Trump national security doctrine of great power competition, where the U.S. is no longer even uh, pretending to wage a war on terror, and it's now back to fighting the great powers, which can justify these bloated defense budgets and all the contracts for half the people in Washington that they need to yeah. get by and pay for their, um, you know, homes out in Potomac, Maryland. I mean, I, I guess what I mean when I say certainly the whole, the, the, the uh, 
the path you chart was um, to some extent fueled by, you know, exaggerated fears of things. I guess I mean two things. That, that certainly there were, there are always people pushing for various policies and 9-11 was definitely an opening for the neocons. But the fact that the public reacted uh, so kind of hysterically, I mean, understandably in a way, but the fact that they exaggerated the actual threat to the American homeland posed by terrorists certainly paved the way for people who at that point had a, a belligerent foreign policy agenda they wanted to advance. And I'd say the same thing about Afghanistan itself. In other words, um, you know, Brzezinski had his little, his mission there, but it was facilitated by the fact that the American public still felt that the Soviet Union was the great menace. And, and it wasn't only at the grassroots level. You know, there, this, I haven't read this biography about Richard Holbrook, but apparently in his diary, it quotes in his diary during the, you know, the, the 60s, kind of the early days of Vietnam, him saying now, and this is apparently his honest belief, I have no doubt that if they take Vietnam, they'll be in Mexico next, you know? So it's like, which in retrospect seems crazy. And, and in fact, you know, I, I, in general with the Soviet Union, I went, I went to Moscow in the early 90s. And when I went into the department stores there, I mean, literally, you go to the section where we would buy washing machines and what they had was washboards. And I just thought, like, we were afraid, you know, I mean, this they just did not have the economic power to pose a genuine long-term threat. And yet there was a genuine fear among many elites, I think, as well as the public. And that drove us and that it's driving us to this day at this moment. There are people yeah. freaked out about Iran for reasons they couldn't even articulate just because people keep repeating phrases about Iran. And yeah. so anyway, but, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to take us too far off the path of your narrative because I think, a lot of it will come as news to some people. And, and, and so whatever the, the set of motivations and conditions that were conducive to the intervention in Afga Afghanistan, a lot of people think it was, thought it was a key move in countering the, the Russians. And then as you document, we uh, very, you know, you might say cynically, but in any event, made use of uh, a bunch of religiously motivated people um, to do our fighting for us. And then, and why don't you say a little more about exactly the cauldron that that created? I mean, so first of all, you're saying, was there an explicit agreement with the Saudis? They, they co-funded the whole operation. It, in any event, it drew in bin Laden. And why don't you kind of take it from there? Well, you, 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 I mean, you were onto something I wanted to address, which is the threat exaggeration. So maybe I can take that on first and then get back to, um, you know, actually, you know, I can address a, a part of it. Um, you know, I do think there was a massive attempt. I mean, there was, there was, there was a clear and calculated program to exaggerate the threat of, um, Islamist terror inside the United States. Um, that's a major theme in my book. And I explain how it fueled the rise of an Islamophobia industry and how Trump became the first national candidate to really capitalize off of the language and the narrative and the energy of this Islamophobia industry um, to win over um, sectors, not only of the Republican base, but of the American public that hadn't really been actively engaged in campaigns. And I argue that, you know, the Pulse nightclub shooting um, by Omar Mateen um, was actually probably a bigger factor in Trump's election than any um, mm -hmm. private troll farm run by some hot dog salesman in St. Petersburg. So back to um, you know the 1990s, there actually was what was effectively an Al Qaeda cell in New York City, and I just you know talked about this in the beginning. The blind Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, who was one of the you know world's leading Wahhabi uh, you, know, you know promulgators of Wahhabi ideology from Egypt, very close to the Al Jihad organization, enters New York um, on a CIA special visa. Um, you know, the CIA wanted to reward all the good things he had done for them in Afghanistan. And he takes over the Services Bureau, which operated out of a supposed charity in New York, um, in downtown New York in Jersey City called Al Kifa. And, and what is the Services Bureau exactly? And the Services Bureau is what um, 
basically Osama bin Laden was funding out of Peshawar to send foreign fighters, um, specifically young Saudi men, products of the Wahhabi school system like, uh, like him, um, to the Afghan battlefield. And so it was in many ways the Soviet, the, sorry, the Saudi contribution to the anti-Soviet jihad. And they had a wing in New York that was overseen by the CIA. Um, the CIA was happy to have it there because they were recruiting men and sending them not just to Afghanistan, but also to Chechnya and Bosnia in support of U.S. interests. Uh, one person who was a part of the Services Bureau was El Said Nosser, who wound up killing the fascist rabbi, Meyer Kahana, mm -hmm. um, in a really under-examined episode that I write about it pretty, I, I go into in detail in my book. Um, but the point is that there was an Al-Qaeda cell in New York City, but it operated at the pleasure of the CIA and under the watch of the FBI in support of U.S. interests until... Um, you know, the FBI and, you know, local law enforcement decided, yeah, yeah we don't need this anymore. Let's kind of cook up a trial. Um, but but I mean, when you say at, at the pleasure of the CIA and, and, and its interests or however you put it, I mean, I mean, the CIA wasn't thinking of it as, I mean, what, how were they? No, they weren't thinking of Al Qaeda as a national security threat right, right there thinking, um, you know, these crazies actually share the same enemies as us. And that's why I lead the book with a quote from Jake Sullivan, who is Hillary Clinton's longtime foreign policy advisor, saying, Al-Qaeda is on our side in Syria, kind of gleefully in an email. This has been the thinking of the national security state um, from 1979 to the present. Mm -hmm. So they, the point is, you know, they eventually decided, you know, let's take these guys down. They are kind of interested in bombing some things around here, even though they don't really have the capacity to do so. Um, but you you, you, you created, they created an atmosphere in New York City where New Yorkers began to actually believe through the tabloid coverage of the trial of the blind sheikh, um, where the, his involvement with the CIA was completely left out of any reporting, um, that there were terrorists in their midst. And so then you have figures like Stephen Emerson, who was sort of a former journalist creating an industry out of this fear, out of the threat, uh, the fear of a, the terrorist next door. Emerson actually wrote a book with that title, um, and he uh, produced a documentary that I think was aired on PBS, The Terrorist Next Door, and it was shown in the Capitol, in the basement of the uh, Longworth building on Capitol Hill to many uh, representatives, kind of introducing Americans to the idea of a war on terror. Um, 9-11 happens. And, you know, I write about two of the most important media figures at the time um, who in helped also introduce the American public to the idea of a war on terror and a permanent war it was Howard Stern, who was kind of broadcasting live the 9-11 attacks, which started out with him describing this date with Pam Anderson he had at a CD bar in Midtown called Scores. And as the second jet hits the World Trade Center, he jokes that, oh, that was probably Pam Anderson's jet. But then when he finds out that it was Muslims who did this and it was an Islamist terror attack, Howard Stern launches into a genocidal tirade alongside his co-host, Robin Quivers. Well, well, when you say chemical. genocidal, you mean literally genocidal or? Yeah, calling for burning their eyes out, nuking them, dropping chemical weapons across the Middle East. Um, and I basically transcribe his rant, which was, this is Howard Stern, the number one drive time host in the country at the mm -hmm. time. Before there was online media or podcasts or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, this is what commuters listen to. And so he became kind of the voice. It was like Orson Welles' War of the Worlds, but it was real. And Howard Stern was Orson Welles. And then the other journalist uh, is Dan Rather. It was Dan Rather, exactly. Uh, a week later, Dan Rather appears on David Letterman. Again, it's like, you know, Americans. At that time, I, I had like four channels. I didn't have cable. So people were really tuned in and Dan Rather had been someone that everyone had been watching for a week, especially older folks. And he comes on the set like he hadn't slept in a week, but he'd mm -hmm. clearly been briefed by someone close to the Bush administration. He was hammering Bush war on terror talking points about how this is going to be a long war. Many will have to die. We're going to have to go to all of these different countries across the Middle East and topple these evil governments who hate us because they're free. And then Dan Rather says, that he has heard, he has gained intelligence that he can't confirm that Arabs 
across the Hudson River were on their rooftops celebrating the 9-11 attacks and that there are secret cells in New York of Al-Qaeda terrorists. And he, you know, he's referring back to the Services Bureau um, and at the same time invoking this Islamophobic and anti-Arab lie that Donald Trump would later uh, spout on the campaign trail in 2015 and 2016. Mm -hmm. And when Donald Trump got fact-checked and everyone came, back, came, came down and said, Trump is making this up, there's no evidence of Arabs celebrating, Trump's fans and his supporters uh, went back to that Dan Rather clip and said, well, the most trusted name in news said it, so it was probably true. And between that period, you had the FBI basically tasked by the Bush administration and then the Obama administration with hunting down the terrorists next door. They must have been there. They had to be there. Um, and because they couldn't do it, first, on the one hand, you have these cooked up phony terror trials of the Holy Land Foundation, uh, which was the largest Muslim American charity sending aid to the Gaza Strip. And its directors went to jail basically for life for sending aid to Gaza. Was that the actual, what, was it because Hamas was a terrorist organization and they had sent uh, aid to Hamas? That was the actual. Uh... Well, they had sent aid to actually the same charities in Gaza that had been funded by the Red Cross and USAID, but they were deemed connected to Hamas in a federal court in one of the phoniest trials I've ever uh, you know, read about. And the directors were sent to prison. Samuel Arian, same thing, a Palestinian professor um, in Florida, uh, became one of the Bush administration's major terror busts. He had no connection to international jihadism and, in fact, no connection at all to terrorism and has been completely vindicated years later. Um, but th there was this, this need to not just inflate the threat, but to um, justify the inflation with actual terror busts. And then the FBI proceeds to develop this army of confidential informants who are basically low-level criminals who wanted to bargain down their crime. They'd pay them six figures to go into mosques um, and prey on mentally vulnerable young Muslim men. And they would then create terror plots in a controlled environment where they would offer someone like, for example, um, James Medina Muhammad in Florida in 2017 um, was told, um, would you like to bomb this synagogue in Aventura, Florida, down the street? And he said, uh, yeah, sure, why not? Let, let's do it. And this is someone who was severely mentally ill, um, who uh, was very vulnerable, who had been in and out of prison, converted to Islam in prison. And then the um, local Florida media and Jewish media reports that there was a ISIS plot to bomb synagogues and that everybody better, you know, either stay home or the synagogues need to increase their security. And the, the context of this plot, which describes the context between the majority, the majority of FBI terror bus since 9-11 was completely left out. And so... You know, in, in, and this is the background also to the Pulse nightclub shooting, well, which he, I think. Yeah, because he had actually been approached by an undercover agent who, who encouraged him to do some kind of terrorism, and he actually declined, right? Uh, he declined, but, you know, who knows how that impacted him, uh, Omar Mateen. Yeah. And meanwhile, his father, Siddiqui Mateen, who after the bombing, I mean, sorry, after this mass shooting at an LGBT nightclub in Orlando, Florida, one of the worst, the, at, at the time, the worst mass shooting in American history, um, shows up at a Hillary Clinton rally behind Hillary Clinton, waving a ready for Hillary sign, and then gives interviews to local media stating that Hillary Clinton is good for national security, to which Donald Trump replies, I would deport the father and the son, even though they're American citizens. And we learn that the father of Omar Mateen was a longtime FBI asset. So there are these, but, but what are all you of making, these unanswered what, questions. What are, you, what are you making of that fact? I, I can't make anything of it except that the FBI had um, eyes and ears all, all around yeah. this. I don't think they planned this was some right. inside job. It's just, and I, and I also think that we have to ask what fact, how, how Omar Mateen being approached by someone asking him and pushing him to carry out a terror attack on U.S. soil actually affected the mentality of someone who is mentally vulnerable yeah. and volatile. Yeah, and I don't want to get off on a tangent, but who was the guy that uh, 
He had been an imam in the U.S. He left the U.S. and Obama had him assassinated, even though he was an American citizen without due process. You know, super famous evangelist imam. What, what's the guy's name? Anwar al Yeah, there, there was a piece in the New York Times Magazine suggesting pretty strongly that the FBI or somebody's, they had tried to blackmail him because he had been seeing a prostitute or something. And that is a what led him to leave the country may have been what radicalized him. I don't know. I, I don't want to get off on this he, tangent. He, he but turns up in my book a lot, actually. And, you know, there are many interesting episodes that um, raise a lot of questions. How, how, you know, th- th- you bring up one episode with Alaki um, that kind of fuels one side of the narrative, which was that he himself had not um, been, quote unquote, radicalized. Um, until the FBI began preying on him. But he also shows up in my book um, having meetings with um, um, Nawaf Al-Hazmi and and Khalid Al-Midhar, who were the two Saudi men who were actually sent into the United States in 1999 um, to carry out the Day of Plains plot. Um, from the Al Qaeda meeting in Malaysia and flew into the US with a direct flight from an Al Qaeda summit in Malaysia where their passports were stolen by CIA agents briefly and photographed. Um, and the CIA, for whatever reason, refused to tell FBI's Alec, Alec Station, you know, their um, Al Qaeda specialists, that these men had entered the United States. They were picked up by a Saudi intelligence agent. Uh, named Omar Bayoumi, who was posing as an employee of the Saudi Civil Aviation Agency. Bayoumi rents them apartments, um, and they go to meet with Alaki um, and have pr- a series of private meetings with him, and we don't know how they wound up meeting him. It could be that you know many uh, young people wanted to meet with him because he was a popular imam and it was completely innocent, but there were these meetings. And then these two figures, um, Hazmi and Midhar, become uh, muscle hijackers, on, I think, the plane that brought, uh, I think, on the plane that um, hit the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, many unanswered questions here. But, um, you know, when you put the picture together, and you put the big picture together, the U.S. national security state, this opaque entity, was openly, was in many ways openly and covertly colluding and working with international jihadist organizations and fueling the rise of jihadism in order to achieve its geopolitical goals. And then when it, we, the American public, experienced the blowback of that project in the form of 9-11 and many other terror attacks, the national security state sort of domestic apparatus proceeded to inflate the terror threat and target the Muslim population as a whole in a way that fueled the rise of an Islamophobia industry, which in turn provided steroids to the political far right and gave characters like Donald Trump a vocabulary that they hadn't had before. Right. And I mean, I'm sure as you were saying earlier, like, well, we kept exaggerating the the terrorist threat and talking about things that happened in the 90s. Um, I can hear some people saying, well, yeah, but 9-11 did happen, right? But your point is we helped we helped make well, it happen. The threat exaggeration occurred after 9-11, you know. Well, that's some, well I, some of it, but in the 90s, yeah. some of the stuff you're talking about was in the 90s, right? But, 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 well, but anyway, yeah. but, but, the, but the point is, the point I'm making is y- you are saying that we helped make 9-11 happen. We can't go into all the details, but a big, a big, uh, a big thing was, of course, the Afghanistan intervention in, in a number of senses. I mean, it drew bin Laden, you know, into this world in a big way. And then, and then, you know, uh, it, it, it then also turned Afghanistan ultimately into a kind of place where he could later find refuge while he plotted 9-11. And in addition, you know, as you know, when he went back to Saudi Arabia after his, uh, his um, Mujahideen years, um, he wasn't happy about the fact that suddenly there were American troops there as a result of a different... Um, foreign policy initiative, the, um, the, the Persian Gulf War, right? Right. And, and that helped turn his focus toward the U.S. as opposed to um, uh, fighting more nearby enemies. So there's a lot of ways that uh, 
you can argue as you do, and, and people should read the book if they're skeptical, but a lot of ways you can argue we helped uh, make 9-11 happen. Why don't we pick up the story there and talk about, um, we've, we've covered it a little bit, but after 9-11, we basically have a series of what strike you as misadventures, big mistakes, mistaken interventions. And I think everyone knows about Iraq. Uh, I, mean, I mean, at least it's now close to a consensus that that was a mistake. I, I, and I guess most people, well, I don't know if they understand that the, the precursor of ISIS took shape in the aftermath of Iraq, in Iraq, right? But, but this, is, this is a big thing for you, right? That w what happens in the environment we created, this is a big part of your argument, what happens in the environment we created in Iraq by invading? Yeah, I mean, it's, the, it's another chapter in the U.S.'s role in fueling the rise of international jihadism and, you know, doing so um, either carelessly or uh, cynically. In the case of Iraq, I mean, you have debathification, uh, this, you know, romantic and ridiculous idea of Douglas Fife that was inspired by denazification, uh, putting the, you know, the apparatus, not just of Saddam Hussein's police state, but, you know, of all, you know, the public, the entire public administration into the street. Um, and at the same time, you have an insurgency, which is influenced and fueled by, um, you know, Saudi Wahhabi ideology on the Sunni side as the Sunni population starts to feel uh, besieged by the Shia majority. And you have the U.S. embracing a, a strategy of sectarianization to break down the insurgency. A uh, figure named James Steele, who had worked with the CIA in El Salvador um, to uh, oversee its death squad policy there um, to kill leftists, essentially, uh, enters the Afghan, sorry, the Iraqi battlefield and starts recruiting Shia militias. Um, to form what were uh, Operation Phoenix style death squads um, to kill Zarqawi's men. Um, so this is after Zarqawi who created the, uh, I guess it was called Al Qaeda in Mesopotamia at that point or yeah. something, right? But it gave birth to, it evolved into ISIS. He had decided to declare war on Shia as part of his own grand right. strategy right. for mobilizing Sunni in the name of jihad, ultimately, I guess. And so we countered, I mean, we did. We, we also did try to win over potentially sympathetic Sunni uh, leaders, and we did some of that. But, but what you're saying is... That was is, later on with the Anbar Awakening. later on. Okay, so this you're is, saying our is, immediate like, reaction was to, was to just kind of join the Shia side in, in the civil war and in that sense amp it up? So this is like 2006, 2007. And, you know, um, Zarqawi, as you mentioned, well, he, he was, you know, basically dead by this point but in 2004 or so he has this argument with Zawahiri who had taken effective control over al-Qaeda Zawahiri was sort of an educated man he came from a, he was a, a doctor he was a physician his family were upper middle class Egyptians he had actually gone on a speaking tour of California and knew uh, Americans um, or understood American society um, his translator on that tour I mentioned earlier Ali Abdul Sud Mohammed was a triple agent for the FBI, CIA, and Zawahiri's Al Jihad organization, um, and he didn't believe that Zarqawi was someone who should be in any leadership role in Al Qaeda. He saw him correctly as a common criminal um, and as a psychopath. Um, Zarqawi's strategy, as you mentioned, was to um, spread as much sectarianism as possible by killing as many Shia uh, civilians as possible in order to create this kind of back and forth uh, where Sunnis have, have to um, shield themselves um, by, you know, by use, basically use Al Qaeda as, a, as their own um, protection force. And in, in many ways it worked when Sarkawi met the Salvador option of James Steele um, because you had these Shia death squads uh, rampaging through Sunni areas and bodies turning up in piles on the street. Um, as the U.S. was also embracing an Israeli-style strategy of 
putting implanting walls between Sunni and Shia neighborhoods to physically sectarianize the environment. Although at that point, I mean, yeah. I remember reading about that, and it seemed to me like an earnest effort to keep them from killing each other. Is that? I mean, it had some of that effect, right? The the uh, the wall thing. I mean, it's just a physical manifestation of a sectarian yeah. environment of se of a sectarian. A construct that previously didn't exist in Iraq. And so once you have that, then you create the basis for an Islamic state, which is really based around the idea, not just of theocracy, but of Sunni supremacy. And um, that takes form, you know, I don't want to get too deep into the details in Camp Buka. And, um, you know, Zarqawi is killed the next, um, you know, leader, uh, the, of Al Qaeda in Mesopotamia fails, and then finally you have um, Abu Bakr Baghdadi um, really rising to the fore, entering Syria through Jabhat al Nusra, which was Al Qaeda's local franchise, as a Trojan horse, and establishing in 2012, um, you know, really being able to establish. Um, sorry, 2013, being able to establish ISIS's caliphate in Raqqa. And so this takes us into Syria. I mean, Iraq and Syria need to be seen as state. I, I, you know, I have Siri. Uh, every, I didn't every, catch that. Every time I say Sir, Syria, Siri comes on. But <laughs> we, need, we need to see the kind of continuity, the seamless cont continuity between and, Iraq and by the way, let's just bracket Libya because we, we don't need to go into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It is another, in your view and, and in mine, misbegotten um, intervention, creates chaos, sends weapons all over the region, including into Syria um, and so on. Uh, and, and that's another, another thing that you think in the end helped create the kind of environment in which a Donald Trump could be elected. But I think you're right. There's enough continuity between Iraq and Syria that for now, uh, wh why don't you go all the way to Syria, even though we think of that as having happened after Libya? I mean, I'm glad you brought Libya into it because, uh, I mean, there, there's a continuity between Libya and Syria, and this is something that's misunderstood as well. So, you know, first of all, um, I think it was in 2012, there was a um, Defense Intelligence Agency document which warned of the rise of a uh, Sunni caliphate in northeastern Syria if the U.S. continued with this nascent policy of arming and training uh, what was going eventually going to be called the Free Syrian Army. And it warned that the Free Syrian Army would become a weapons farm for Al-Qaeda and ISIS, um, for Al-Qaeda and what could become an Islamic State, and that Al-Qaeda was already active and benefiting from um, this U.S. kind of semi-covert policy of dumping arms into Syria. Now, the first um, shipments of arms, many of them actually came from the Libyan rat line. Mm -hmm. And Libya was a place, and I write about this, where the U.S., uh, alongside Qatar and France, but specifically the Gulf states, had been leaning on um, an Al-Qaeda, longtime Al-Qaeda affiliate, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, um, as its local on-the-ground proxy. It was figures from this group um, who um, weren't that dis distant from Ansar al-Sharia, um, which was behind the Benghazi attack that helped doom Hillary Clinton's presidential ambitions. It was this group that sodomized Gaddafi with a bayonet in his hometown of Sirte and shot him in the head and left him to rot on a mattress in a butcher shop in Misrata um, well, under NATO air cover. So the U.S. was already working with, um, you know, long-time um, extremist affiliates, and actually John McCain went to meet its leadership in Benghazi and declared that they're not Al-Qaeda. When Christopher Stevens, the, the U.S. ambassador, was killed, he was in Benghazi at the consulate, and you know it was out of Benghazi where the arms shipments from Qaddafi's um, arms depots um, that had been captured by the rebel proxies, the insurgent proxies, were being redirected to the Syrian battlefield. It's what a former Hillary Clinton advisor called the bank shot. And these arms were being taken and seized by uh, the most effective fighting force on the Syrian battlefield, which was Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, so this, so this, yeah. this was certainly not well publicized at the time, but it is well documented now that we were sending, uh, that the U.S. was steering weapons from Libya 
to Syria, I guess. And, uh, and Abdel Hakim Belhaj, who was the founder of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, longtime Al Qaeda affiliate, um, who kind of was, you know, domesticated through Libyan politics. Um, he was having open meetings with the leadership of what became the Free Syrian Army, which was the CIA's proxy force, the so-called moderate rebels in Syria. And it was the Free Syrian Army that escorted al-Nusra, the local al-Qaeda affiliate, into Raqqa, helped it take over, and then half of the FSA fighters um, joined ISIS after ISIS declared its caliphate there, and the other half went up um, upfield mm. to uh, battle the Syrian government army. So, so the CIA and its, you know, the CIA's proxy forces were involved at every step of the way in helping the advance of ISIS, an advance that John Kerry later admitted the U.S. was exploiting in a hope of forcing Assad to negotiate his own demise. And so how early were we steering weapons into Syria? Do you know the year? I, I mean, the Syrian, I mean, I write about the, um, the, the, the genesis of the, what's, what's called the Syrian uprising and how there were, in 2011, and how there were many different facets. There were reformist youth who were protesting among university campuses for, you know, less corruption, for more freedoms. And there were Islamists who were protesting uh, because they wanted women to be able to wear niqab in public schools. Um, they wanted a reversal of the constitution Hafez al-Assad had in, um, inaugurated in the early 70s that led the Muslim Brotherhood to ultimately revolt. And the Syrian rebellion was militarized or was violent early on. Um, there were killings of Syrian soldiers in Banyas uh, just weeks after it began. There was, in July 2011, the massacre of over 100 Syrian soldiers in Jazir al-Shagur, which is now under al-Qaeda control in Idlib. So uh, weapons were on the battlefield by the summer of 2011. Um, but we don't know that was, those were American-supplied weapons. They may not have been. But the Americans' weapons began flowing in from the Incirlik Air Base in Turkey in 2012 in a really official capacity in what became... Operation Timber Sycamore, which um, delegated one out of every $13 um, from the CIA's black budget to arming Syrian mm -hmm. insurgents. Um, that actually became a larger operation than Operation Cyclone in Afghanistan, but, you know, run along the very same lines with the same intention and the same cynical carelessness. And, uh, you know, what resulted from it was the worst refugee crisis since World mm -hmm. War II. Um, and all sorts of other forms of blowback. And this is, I mean, this gets to the reason I'm asking you, like how early and consequential was the American intervention? So just to, to stay on that theme for a second, I, I think if you take the, the, the huge exodus of refugees out of the picture, it's quite possible, well, it's possible Brexit doesn't happen. It's possible that uh, various right-wing uh, nationalist forces in various European countries don't get energized. It's possible that Trump doesn't happen. I mean, certainly if you take out not only the uh, uh, exodus of refugees, but ISIS, which had, you know, festered and, and taken shape in that context, it's, it, if you take that out, it's even easier to imagine these things not happening. And, and I find that when I say to people, I mean, first of all, one of the things that drives me craziest, and I'm sure it drives you craziest, is, is the thing you, you hear. It's like, well, gosh, in Iraq, we tried intervening. That didn't work. In Syria, we tried not intervening. That didn't work. What yeah. should we do? Well, I mean, we did intervene big time. Well, well, uh, you tell me how big time. I mean, because that's the part I'm not expert enough to know. Look, we did send <laughs> weapons in. And what I say to people is, look, as, as unhappy as I am myself with the prospect of letting a brutal dictator suppress um, a rebellion and dissent, I think, in fact, we, you know, he wound up in control. He's still running Syria. That, that was the ending anyway. And I think we'd be in a better place if he had just uh, suppressed it earlier, uh, killed fewer people and created a lot fewer refugees, however kind of cold and clinical that may sound. And so maybe it was a mistake for the U.S. to undeniably amp up a civil war. Now, what I don't know is how critical were we to 
doing the amping up? Because there were other interested parties who wanted things amped up. Turkey, there, there were regional actors. I genuinely don't know whether the U.S. had the power to prevail upon our, al- I mean, so assume total enlightenment. Assume that like Obama sees the future and goes, you know, this is only going to lead to ruin uh, if, we, if we intensify this civil war um, and maybe even in effect turn into a civil war, depending on how early and influential we, we were. But if you assume that that kind of enlightenment, Obama's part, what I don't know is, is if it was within our power, if we send like zero weapons to Syria and use what leverage we had on our allies to not intervene, and it wasn't infinite leverage, I'm sure, because they had real interest there, you know, could, could we have had a radically different outcome where you just don't get the massive civil war, the, the ton of deaths and uh, refugees and, and the, the ongoing chaos? Yeah, I mean, the U.S. was absolute, played an absolutely pivotal role in doing what was spelled out in all of these neoconservative regime change documents in the 90s, which was destabilizing Syria, uh, which in turn leads to a refugee crisis, which first and foremost spreads misery for millions of people who are forced to leave their homes and shouldn't have to. Um, and, you know, and then as you, as you correctly mentioned, uh, inspi- you know, provides a political shot in the arm for far right forces in Europe that bear the brunt. Um, when Europe bears the brunt of a refugee crisis and Donald Trump adopted a lot of his political language, uh, from the European far right, um, through his political brain, Steve Bannon, who is studying those populist movements. If you want to even call them populist, they're basically sort of pseudo proto fascist. Um, but, you know, the U.S. role in this, in driving the destabilization of Syria was absolutely pivotal. It was Hillary Clinton's leadership, um, that helped drive it when she declared at a Friends of Syria conference and in subsequent interviews that negotiations with Syria and the Syrian government, which was very interested in negotiations, as the Venezuelan government is right now, by the way, uh, are not possible and are off the table and that the hard men with guns will will decide um, the outcome of Syria. Those were her exact words, the hard men with guns. It was U.S. weapons that made this all possible, even though it was often Saudi money that was used to buy it um, for the Jaysh al-Islam, Army of, of Islam militia that controlled much of the territory outside eastern Damascus, um, even though it was Qatari money that helped buy it for Jabhat al-Nusra, the al-Qaeda affiliate that eventually would take control of the Idlib province, even though it was Turkish money that would buy it for Arar al-Sham, the uh, Turkish militia that would take five provinces, sorry, five neighborhoods in eastern Aleppo alongside Noradin al Zinki, which was one of the CIA's favorite groups until it sawed the head off of a 19 year old Palestinian teen, Abdullah Isa, on camera. Um, the U.S was directing this. And in, in, in the beginning, it actually turned to the same figures. Um, Bandar bin Sultan, um, the Saudi prince, um, to, that, that it used during the dirty wars of Central America um, to, to connect with straw buyers in places like Croatia um, to get the weapons early on before the Pentagon started making these mass authorizations. And so in 2015, um, when the U.S. was getting more and more desperate and angry, you know, why aren't we seeing more results? Why aren't we able to take Damascus? Um, you know, why can't the Army of Islam of Zahran Alush, who's pledged to ethnically cleanse and murder all Alawites, uh, why can't he cleanse the coasts? You know, they start shipping in BGM tow missiles. Um, you know, these are produced by Raytheon, and they're very effective at taking out the kind of T-72 tanks that the Syrian army has in droves. And they begin to actually start pushing back around Idlib, um, taking out a lot of tanks in 2015. You have to look at the geography of Idlib. It's in northwestern Syria. Um, it's very close to the coasts where a lot of religious minorities, especially the Alawites, live. And there had been operations where the Alawites had suffered mass slaughter um, and also where Christians had to abandon their villages, including ancient Armenian villages. So there was this fear that set in, um, in Damascus, like, holy shit, they're actually, you know, starting to give them heavy weapons. And 
they turned to Moscow and said, you know, you guys have said you, you'll support us no matter what. Well, you're about to have a country that's about as far from you as West Virginia is from Washington, D.C., overrun by the monster of all monsters. And Russia directly intervenes me, and reverses. Me, meaning, meaning ISIS and jihadists, the monster of all yes. monsters. Black flags Not- over Damascus, a yeah. uh, previously pluralistic society with many Christians, Shiites, and, and Alawites. And Russia has a naval facility in Syria uh, and in has Khartoum. for a long time. I mean, it's not shocking that they would consider it a place where they needed to maintain stability. I mean, I'm not applauding it, but but it's the way we it's the way the US always behaves toward countries where we have military bases and towards some where we don't. Well, you had a situation in Afghanistan where Brzezinski, who we talked about before, actually saw arming the Mujahideen as the Afghan trap where he would draw in the Red Army and then the US would begin to bleed the Red Army. And I think there was some thinking in the, you know, in national security circles to the extent that, you know, there could be called national security circles that drawing Russia into Syria, which was its only f- sort of allied state within the Arab League, where, it, you, as you mentioned, it has a naval base, would actually weaken Russia, which is the ultimate, one of the ultimate objectives of the U.S. national security state. But that didn't happen. Um, Russia's intervention alongside Iran and Hezbollah was, um, you know, they, they performed very well um, with limited forces and actually, um, you know, it, it took probably, th- you know, three years for them to effectively neutralize the insurgency. Um, and they did so sort of, uh, you know, piece by piece by piece, but they succeeded. And I think they were underestimated by the U.S. national security state. What they succeeded in doing was reversing the onslaught of the Islamic State and Al Qaeda. That's pretty much the only way to understand it. And that's how John Kerry understood it in this meeting I write about in my book, The Management of Savagery, where he's meeting with Syrian opposition activists, including the head of the White Helmets, Raid al Salah, um, this, you know, what was supposed to be a rescue organization, but it's actually an influence operation. Um, and they're all begging John Kerry to bomb Syria. They're beseeching him to bomb Syria. This is 2016. And John Kerry said, well, it's too late for that. You know, we're not going to do it. You failed. And, you know, what actually wound up happening was that we were watching ISIS march forward. We were watching ISIS. In other words, we were failing to stop ISIS. We weren't fighting ISIS um, because we thought it would bring Assad to the negotiating table. And that never happened because Russia intervened. And he said Russia intervened because ISIS and these other extremist forces were on the march. And they were on the march because the U.S. was arming them. Mm -hmm. So the Russian intervention in Syria was a direct and completely logical response to what the U.S. was doing in Syria, which was an indirect intervention that became a direct intervention. And there are now U.S. troops there to try to prevent Assad from winning the peace. And that means massive civilian suffering under sanctions. And the U.S. intervention, in your, in your view, was having the effect of, in fact, empowering some of the forces we profess to oppose, the, the, the jihadist forces, the radical Islamist forces, because we were so obsessed with Assad and then later with Russia. Um, yeah. In order to defeat a country that posed no threat to the United States whatsoever, the United States put arms in the uh, heavy weapons in the hands of the very same organization that was behind the 9-11 attacks and has now gifted that organization with an entire province in Syria, which exists under the protection of Donald Trump, the most Islamophobic president in U.S. history. That's sort of the paradox of the national security state. Um the uh, so I guess the answer to my one question: How critical was the U.S. role? I, I, I gather one thing you're saying is no matter how determined, say Turkey might have been to supply weapons, there were certain kinds of weapons that we had control over that were that, that they just couldn't have uh, put in the field without us giving a, a NATO. And, and you know, Turkey is a NATO country. Of course, they had their own interest in destabilizing Syria, um, but I, the, I think the U.S. role was pivotal, and also um, in authorizing participation of the Gulf states and helping kind of um, ease the path for them. 
So we said we'd talk about the controversy surrounding your book. Uh, so let's do that. If you have time for one more question before we do that, it's a question of motivation in Syria. Now, again, I think you're, you're, you tend to see a pretty, you know, consciously, I don't know, imperialistic or whatever uh, drive, heavily influenced by neocon ideology. My take on Obama himself is that he unfortunately had a kind of a muddled, he didn't come in with clear foreign policy convictions. He was torn but between a kind of a realist instinct and a kind of uh, a sympathy for the kind of Samantha Powers human rights arguments. Assad was a bad guy. Let's let's stipulate that. Obama didn't want to, you know, help help him do bad things. And at some point he uttered the phrase, Assad must go. I don't know how much thought he gave to that, but that that kind of been cement. So so my view of Obama is like it's not like he's a neocon plant, right? It's like, and his view was certainly important. And so I guess in general, I see, I often see a confluence of events leading to really unfortunate decisions. But what is your, do you have a take that differs from that? I think every, every uh, conversation we've had, we've had this debate about Obama. Um, but, you know, I think Obama was sort of a weak figure who deferred to characters like Samantha Power or Hillary Clinton on um, events like the Libyan intervention and then Syria. Um, but I write about actually an episode in my book where Obama snaps at Samantha Power and says, please, I've read your book enough already about, you know, the common carpenters and farmers and moderate who want to become moderate rebels, like enough. Um, you know, Obama and Ben Rhodes had, who is his deputy national security advisor, had this thing called not doing stupid shit. And that was what they adopted, I think, after Libya and after Syria. After doing stupid such, shit. After doing so much stupid shit. And Ben Rhodes, who is like a little older than me, um, was His part of- His background was in creative writing, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe I chose the wrong um, <laughs> path and I could have had some kind of like uh, influence over- shaping Middle East. If you'd gotten policy. the MFA, I think you'd be you'd be a respected member of the foreign policy staff. Yeah. If I had just done my uh, you know I never got a master's thesis, but if I had done it on Emily Dickinson's uh Was that his subject? Theory, I I actually have no idea. But in <laughs> I, any I mean case, I will say as voices in, in the Washington conversation these days go, his his is not a bad one, but partly because no, I think he was he, chastened, I think, but and I think many of his instincts are good, and he's right that the blob is the blob. He, if nothing else, we should give them credit for giving us the term the blob. Yeah, they recognize that there is this blob, which I call the national security state in my book. Um, but Ben Rhodes was part of what uh, Bob Gates uh, was then the CIA director and was a very realist-minded figure called the backbenchers in the Obama administration. And these were the 50, 40 and 50-something, mostly 40-something um, people in the like mid-level positions who really wanted to just do something to support the Arab Spring. And I remember, you know, the fervor around the Arab Spring and how it kind of influenced everyone who was interested in the Middle East and helped, you know, I, I mean, I even kind of overlooked a lot of the um, imperial subtexts. But Ben Rhodes... Yeah, and by the way, I don't want to act like I had a clear, well-thought-out view on Syria from the get-go. It, it, yeah. it, you know, it was it was it was disorienting. Uh, and yeah. so anyway, go ahead. Absolutely. And the propaganda was disorienting. Um, but Obama sided with the backbenchers over Bob Gates on Libya. Um, this was the kind of seminal debate. And I think that sort of flowed into Syria. And then there was this push to just let's just do something. And Obama, um, for a variety of reasons, allowed the backbenchers and the national security state itself, the CIA, uh, John Brennan, you know, they love these big, these big covert operations. It really gives them something to do and to justify their budget um, to do something without a direct intervention. I think that was the ultimate result of the deal, which was a very, um, you know, a rare, um, a rare bright moment in U.S. diplomacy and foreign policy, the deal that Obama cut with uh, Sergei Lavrov and um, the Russian government in 2013 to not intervene um, and to destroy Syria's chemical stocks. It was a rare instance of U.S. diplomacy, period, 
over military policy, but then Obama proceeds to rubber stamp or authorize, you know, billions of dollars or hundreds of millions in weapons shipments uh, mm -hmm. on the grounds of that. Yeah, you can just do something. And for the Saudis, it's also incentive to kind of stand aside while Obama um, inks the Iran deal. Um, you know, so there are all these different yeah, factors. Yeah. Obama was ultimately very weak, and there's just a lack of thinking. Um, there's there, there's a lack of perspective in in Washington, even among those who are critical of the blob, on what war means in today's world. War. I think we're going to see much less conventional warfare, especially between the powerful countries, and hybrid warfare, or uh, what's also called like fourth generation warfare will become the order of the day. And that means sanctions. Uh, we just learned today that the U.S. intends to sanction Venezuela's free food program, the CLAP um, program. In, in, in other words, sanctions as a means of mass starvation to force governments to their knees, as well as um, you know unconventional warfare like we saw in Syria. And this does constitute intervention. It does constitute war. And you could even say it constitutes a hot war. Mm -hmm. So about the controversy surrounding your book. So uh, what happened? So you were going to speak uh, at, at a politics and prose in DC, which is, of course, kind of a cultural icon in DC, an important platform for talking about a book. And then some, uh, some people tried to keep you from uh, talking about it, and I gather, well, well, who were they? What was their grievance? Their main issue was Syria, I gather, right? You know, what, what things you say about Syria? Who, who is, was it an identifiable group or just a bunch of people phoning into politics and prose or what? Well, it was not necessarily, I wouldn't describe it as an amorphous mass. It was definitely an organized echo chamber that had been preparing this um, because it had failed to destroy my career or eliminate my platform ever since I wrote my two-part investigation into the white helmet, the Syrian white helmets in um, 2016, late 2016. Okay, so this is the group that is, you know, known publicly as uh, people who, I guess, administered aid to victims of the Syrian war. I think their professed mission was to help people on both sides, I gather, but your view is, if you look at where they were getting their money, uh, which is from, I guess, Western governments, Britain, and so on. And um, and uh, anyway, you view th they were not kind of, they were not truly neutral. They they became the con a key conduit of information to journalists because they were actually on the scene, whereas the scene was too dangerous for most journalists to go to. And so in your view, they actually helped, they became a mouthpiece for kind of, um, you know, U.S. anti-Assad, propaganda do do i have that fairly right well it's not my view i mean these are just established facts the, the white helmets was they were they didn't help anyone on both sides in fact they participated they were filmed members of white helmets in white helmets uniform did they profess were to filmed, did they were filmed were filmed participating in executions of civilians uh, carried out under the theocratic law imposed by the very forces that the white helmets were exclusively embedded with including Al Qaeda's local franchise and ISIS. The White Helmets worked with ISIS. This is just an established fact. And the White Helmets simultaneously, through their public relations firm, the Syria Campaign, which grew out of Avaz and uh, you know a, a PR group called Purpose, um, they'd run around claiming that they're just lifesavers who help people on both sides, um, and that they deserve a Nobel Prize and they were nominated for a Nobel Prize and this Netflix documentary was made about them, even though journalists couldn't actually access the areas where the White Helmets were because they would wind up like James Foley or be kidnapped like so many other journalists because these areas were controlled by extreme Islamist insurgents. The White Helmets were essentially a mash unit for Al Qaeda and that's just indisputable. It's just indisputable and so this, to me, is one of the biggest scandals of our time. And when you have $30 million, $35 million from USAID, an arm of the State Department, and $55 million from the British Foreign Office, and who knows how much money from Qatar, flowing into the White Helmets through Turkey. The White Helmets weren't formed in Syria. They're not actually a Syrian organization. Um, then you have a lot of money to do uh, a lot of damage with to critics 
um, and also to just mount a gigantic PR influence operation to stimulate Western support for a direct military intervention. And that's what the White Helmets proceeded to do. They had a petition, if you went to the White Helmets website, uh, it might even still be there, I don't know, for a no-fly zone. The no-fly zone is basically code for doing to Syria what was done to Yugoslavia. Hillary Clinton even admitted in one of her private Goldman Sachs talks that a no-fly zone would, quote-unquote, kill a lot of Syrians. Um, that's what the, the White Helmets wanted. The White Helmets' leadership, uh, Rayad El Saleh, came to Washington repeatedly to lobby for sanctions on the state of Syria, sanctions that are now grinding entire Syrian cities to a halt because they have prevented the shipment of fuel, including heating fuel for Syrian families during winter. What kind of rescue organization lobbies for sanctions and war on an entire country? That's what the White Helmets were. And then they also had sophisticated communications equipment and they'd feed whatever they filmed or, you know, et obviously, you know, they just basically filmed themselves running with babies through rubble. I really have no evidence that they rescued the 100,000 people, they said, but they just filmed themselves running through rubble in places journalists couldn't get to. Then they'd send it to their communication center in Gaziantep, Syria, and then it would go out to the whole Western press corps. And so when I came in as someone who, you know, definitely wasn't mainstream, but was sort of a well-known progressive journalist taking the white helmets down for all of this, in if in indisputable fashion i mean no one could discount any of the facts then you not only have the people behind the white helmets and this this sort of fanatical anarcho neocon element of just weird you know weird children uh who like fell in love with this whole operation uh bringing the wrath of of the atheist god down on me um, but you also have a lot of the Western correspondents in the Middle East who had relied so heavily on the White Helmets to the point where they were even calling for people to donate money to them, um, just becoming furious. So who were, you, who, were your biggest, who were your biggest uh, tormentors in your view, like, well, especially when it came time to, with the book? Yeah, the so this is, this, is a, this is so fascinating to me. You know, you mentioned politics and prose. It's like where you... If you are a prominent, semi-prominent author, if you're going to do your book launch in DC, it's going to be at politics and prose. So they didn't, they wanted me to be denied that legitimacy. And I was able to see through the Twitter campaign who was really leading the charge. And it was figures like James Le Mercurier, who was the British military intelligence officer, a former British officer who founded the White Helmets in, in Turkey, was tweeting at the bookstore. I mean, this isn't even an American. And then you had Moaz Mustafa, who is a major Syrian regime change lobbyist in Washington, who helped take, he took John McCain on his notorious trip, illegal trip into Syria, where McCain met with two um, um, rebel kidnappers. Um, Mustafa was uh, instrumental in driving the regime change narrative uh, for years. And he was tweeting at politics and prose. You had Charles Lister, who, you know, I call him Charles Blacklister because he's so uh, vicious towards critics of Syrian regime change, but he's at the Gulf-funded Middle East Institute. And he was the figure that David Cameron and um, I think even the CIA turned to to kind of come up with the lists of moderate rebels. And I challenged Lister publicly at the Atlantic Council uh, when he was on one of their panels um, and asked him why he had listed Nora Dean Elzenki this group that had beheaded a teenager on camera and had been, you know, accused of so many human rights atrocities as moderate rebels. And I, when I asked him that, Noradin Elzenki had just entered into a coalition with the rebranded Al Qaeda affiliate. So it was just obvious that these people had an axe to grind with me. It was like I had I'm written a book. I'm not surprised. But, yeah. but let, me, let me ask you. So on the, there is a spectrum of cynicism one can imagine on this issue. And I think I know which end you're on, but let me just be clear. So you can imagine on the one end, like, okay, uh, this group was set up to, you know, with kind of good intentions. I mean, obviously, if all the money's coming from one side of the fight, can't expect true neutrality. But most of the people signed up 
thought of themselves as doing good, not as like, not, not as their mission being to issue propaganda, but their hearts were, they, 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 most of the people who sign up for this are naturally going to be not fans of Assad. That's where their hearts were. If journalists call them, that's the perspective they're going to talk from. But, but that's never relayed back to the Western. Uh, right, right. I will say even that, even that possibility was never publicized in mainstream outlets, right? Yeah, I mean, and it continues to this day. You had this huge piece by Anne Barnard, who's now a fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, you know, Wall Street's favorite think tank, who was the longtime bureau chief in Beirut for the New York Times. And the piece is about Assad's secret torture prisons. And, you know, there's no denying that Syria under the Assad family has been a police state. But the sources in this piece are exclu almost exclusively sources uh, that are created and funded by the very states that have funded the Syrian insurgency, the Syrian Network for Human Rights, which is largely based, I think, out of Qatar and is a front for the Syrian opposition. One of its leaders is Burhan Galyun, who is the longtime head of the Syrian National Council, which is the Syrian government in exile. And Barnard cites them as an independent organization. She says they're an independent human rights organization that keeps the most meticulous count on deaths and they say that 100, like 14,000 people have been tortured to death, but they prove there's no, there's no documentation there. Like we have no way of checking that. And this organization is essentially a front for the Syrian opposition. And then there's another group, CIJA, um, which was funded, who it's, it was created out of the State Department, basically it was funded $2 million a year by the State Department. And they collaborated with, al-Nusra and other extremist groups to gather government documents in areas that the insurgents had captured. And this is another one of her sources and it's referred to as an independent organization. So, you know, let's, you know, fine, write your little article, but let's say what these organizations are. They're essentially influence fronts for the opposition and the states that funded it that have an interest in seeing regime change in Syria. And once you make that acknowledgement, according to all journalistic ethical guidelines that you're supposed to follow, your whole piece falls apart and it's no longer credible. And so what they're essentially doing is deceiving the Western public by telling them that the white helmets are nonpartisan and they save everyone. And, um, you know, that the Syrian network for human rights is independent. It's just not true. And so when I come in and say, well, here's the context that's missing, then I get accused of being a genocide denier. And I think that's why a lot of people self-censor around these issues is because they don't want to withstand those attacks. And the attacks, I mean, they've been really severe to the point where I've gotten calls on my personal phone number warning me I mean, against- They're calling you a genocide denier because you're suggesting that some of the numbers you get from the White Helmets may be inflated? Is that- Well, just, or, you know, anything critical of these organizations which have shaped the entire narrative of Western media around the Syrian crisis. Anything, if you come in- um, from a critical perspective, you're an Assadist um, and you are a genocide denier. And, you know, Assadism has been defined by these people as sort of akin to hate speech or anti-Semitism. Mm. So you should be immediately deplatformed, even if the facts do stand up. And the facts on my side really do stand up. Uh, yeah, I actually had occasion to talk to a, a high-ranking United Nations official who's job would have entailed knowing this territory pretty well. And I asked him, this was within the last year, I asked him about the White Helmets and I said, you know, there are these reports that maybe they're not entirely to be trusted or whatever. What he said was, well, I think there may have been some, I think he used the term infiltration. He said, I think there may have been some, like there were some bad actors or something within the White Helmets, but he was, <laughs> I don't want to say minimizing it, but he wasn't uh, that was his, and he wasn't somebody, I don't think, I mean, his background leads me to think he wasn't somebody who would have a particular, who would be particularly partisan on either side of the war itself. But anyway, you're, you're, you're saying, uh, kind of it goes beyond that. You're, you're viewing it as like a, a very consciously constructed propaganda. It's an it's an influence operation that was designed to stimulate Western and spe specifically kind of middle class liberal support in the UK and the US for an intervention that the American public was rightly 
opposed to and suspicious of. And this is how you get a war weary public uh, aroused. It's not by saying we're going to eradicate evil or we're going to bomb the evildoers. It's we're going to save the children. And here's a campaign you can get in. We're going to fight perpetual war to save the children. I mean, it's very simple. Um, that's why we were introduced to Bana Alabed, who is this six-year-old girl who barely spoke English, who would read these kind of prepared scripts and appear suddenly on CNN saying, please save me. It's like they, you know, the white helmets weren't enough. I mean, Let's you get see a why child. People, you see why people react about this, because uh, I'm sure you'd agree, like, whatever the story on her, she's just a poor six-year-old girl. I, I, you know, if somebody gives a, me a script, the, I would have read it at six. Know, yeah. Yeah, you, you know, I mean, it just seems like you have to be careful just knowing no, I human think, I emotional think, uh, Bob, sensibilities the, as they are, you know. You're right. I mean, yeah, if you, you know, you have to make a decision. Do you let this take place as a journalist who's, you know, crit naturally critical and, you know, opposed to war and empire and save yourself the grief of being attacked as a genocide denier, um, you know, abusing the Syrian Anne Frank, or do you call it out for what it is? And, you know, really, it takes an acknowledgement that the attacks you get are just manufactured outrage. It's fake outrage from an echo chamber that is part and parcel of this influence operation that, if it succeeded, would kill a whole lot more children than are being currently killed. Um, and, you know, we should also ask ourselves why there's no Bana Alabed from Gaza that Jake Tapper is telling everyone to turn to as a Palestine expert. Uh, why don't we hear about the rescuers in the Gaza Strip who have been actually targeted, according to a recent UN report, by the Israeli military during the Great March of Return? It's pretty freaking obvious they are unworthy victims in the eyes of empire. Um, they are inconvenient victims, and the U.S. has no stake. The West has no stake in seeing the status quo change around the Gaza Strip, and so the Western public is not going to be introduced to them as sympathetic figures. So, you know, I'm fine taking all the whatever online abuse I've taken. Just And I, I, and think, I, I think you're, like, temperamentally equipped for that, right? Like, you do not – like, I was watching some of your videos around the Venezuelan embassy. It's like – you don't mind confrontation and conflict, right? I mean, no, I think like, you know, it, it, it's an information war um, that we're in. Journalism in the West has been really rapidly transformed into an information war. And that doesn't mean that um, I want to fight dirty. And, you know, my journalism's what I, I, my perspective is known. I think you, you don't hide your perspective either. Um, but, you know, our journalism rises and falls on the facts. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, in any war, there's an element of fear and, uh, you have to suppress that fear in order to get the job done. But I mean, it's very unpleasant. Um, at the same time, it's really rewarding to bust, uh, imperial propaganda and to, um, re to see it resonate. Um, especially outside the United States where people don't fall for the same ploys. And uh, I, I, I have, however, been prepared in ways that maybe other people who didn't grow up in Washington in the kind of um, sleazy Washington politics world, uh, you know, they haven't been able to uh, be prepared ever since childhood for this kind of atmosphere. So, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely accustomed to it, but that doesn't mean it's not unpleasant or that I really enjoy it. I mean, I'd, 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 I'd love to live in a country where like journalism was judged on its merits. Um, and it, it wasn't an information war, but it simply is at this point. Okay. Well, uh, and then did they succeed in shutting you down? Have you been successfully deplatformed anywhere or were? Well, that's it. Yeah. I, I guess I didn't address that. Um, politics and prose. First of all, I got on the phone with its owners and they were frightened um, because they'd received so many calls and Syrian American council, which kind of is like the Syrian version of like the Cuban American national fund, the kind of Miami Cuban lobby. Mm -hmm. um, they, they directed a lot of calls to them and they were, you know, basically saying, you know, I'm a genocide denier and I'm a liar. And the owners were like, 
all right, is this true? And they kind of seemed to have been convinced that I was a Holocaust denier until they started reading the book and they started to get a lot of pushback, um, which was absolutely organic um, from a lot of their customers, um, people in Washington, who even people who didn't totally agree with me, um, who were just disgusted that this had taken place um, and a lot of online pushback. And, um, you know, I think they realized that they had been had a little bit, um, but there were safety concerns on their part. Um, and if you've, you've seen some of the things that have happened at Politics and Pros recently, some white supremacists stormed in and interrupted a talk. Um, I didn't know that. You know, you know this, is, this is like an uptown kind of um, yeah, I've, I've spoken. middle class um, lo- um, kind of um, culture. And it's right next door to Comet Ping Pong, where someone actually did go in right. with an assault rifle and fire a bullet during the Pizzagate um, saga. So there's a lot of trepidation and fear still. And um, there were things I, I can't even discuss that went like slightly beyond threats, um, which really are just absolutely disgusting to see this happen to this bookstore. But you, um, did you wind up speaking under? So I had to, I had to move it to I, I I planned an event just on my own at another location, and Politics and Pros came out and supported that event. Um, they promoted it and they sold books there. So in a way, it was kind of like. Uh, and they donated the profits from the book sales to some free speech organization. I don't remember what okay. it is. And that conversation, by the way, is on your podcast, Moderate Rebels, right? Yeah, we, we talked about it and I've talked about it elsewhere. And then since then, my book tour, there have been attempts. But I mean, that very, isn't that very, or maybe not, maybe that's not. The conversation. Oh, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Bob. Uh, yeah. The, the um, conversation I had at my launch is on Moderate Rebels. Right. And, uh, you know, they, they tr- there was an attempt to shut me down at the People's Forum in New York. By the way, if you're in New York, that's a really interesting new location um, for books and events. But that failed. I had a full house there, standing room only. Um, and then we had, you know, I just had a really uh, well-attended talk in Berkeley. And I don't think there, you know, there, there was going to be a lot of traction for, you know, pro-war regime change lobbyists in Berkeley. So, yeah, the tour has gone really well. Um, this. And, you know, the controversy has helped drive sales. So I really thank all of the regime change trolls for their, for their help. Okay. Uh, well, thanks, Max. Now, where, where do people find you on Twitter? What's the Twitter handle? Well, it's just my name, Max Blumenthal. Okay. Um, check out thegrayzone.com. Uh, we're doing, you know, original journalism. It's not, it's not just, uh, you know, opinion and commentary. It is different and- from, from other outlets. I can, I can verify that. Thank you. And, and uh, Moderate Rebels is my podcast with Ben Norton. Okay. Um, and check out our YouTube channel, um, The Gray Zone, as well. Okay. My Twitter handle is Robert Ryder, W-R-I-G-H-T-E-R. And again, the name of the book is The Management of Savagery, How America's National Security State Fueled the Rise of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and Donald Trump, which I have to say I agree is the case. So <laughs> uh, I would recommend people read it. So thanks a lot, Max. Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate it. Okay. Take care.